Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. sitting with my best friend tony what's up buddy what's happening brother hey man it's great to uh see you here i did a, a bunch of podcasts at premiere all by myself and i told everyone to uh, text you and email you and give you a hard time for not being there i was wondering why they were doing that i was <laughs> but i you know unfortunately uh you know i missed it but i was hanging out in iceland dude it was yeah it was it was uh it, it was an amazing trip and you know congratulations to jacob your son because uh the graduation present was going to iceland with you and your wife yeah, he uh he's still uh, he's in Germany now. He's chilling in Germany for a couple of weeks and he comes back on the 21st and uh then uh, I think we're heading back to the beach. How magical is Iceland? Oh my goodness, dude. I if anybody has an opportunity to go, you got to go. I mean the the scenery, the magic, I mean the the earth is literally it feels alive. That it was it kind of like like you and I were in Yellowstone a couple of years together and it kind of had like that. To me it was like it was almost like a religious experience. It was like you feel like you feel like there's something greater out there and you're insignificant, but you're a part of that greater thing too. It's like this yin and yang kind of feeling. Um, Very much so. It's like it's like Yellowstone and Zion kind of combined. It, it was like that. I mean, it's just you, you have all, all the fissures, the 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 geysers, the the mountains, the waterfall. It was just the land is spectacular. I, I hope I hope to get up there. This although, although uh, sorry for for no, any no, Icelanders, no. Uh, you go into the city of Reykjavik and it's like an architectural nightmare. It's like everything was like a square building that looked like it was built in 1970. Really? Oh, it was like I'm like what? Come on, guys. So it doesn't have like the charm of Europe then or anything. No, I mean the the city center it does a little bit, but what? But right outside of that, no. It was just like all like like government kind of like buildings and stuff. Yeah, a big bunch of square nineteen seventy buildings. It was just weird. Oh, that's great. That well, maybe they didn't, maybe they didn't want to take away from their like unbelievable um um environment there. But, you know. Yeah, but outside, I mean, e even saying that, it was uh -huh. it was still pretty incredible. I can, I hope to get there, man. I hope to get there. Hey, so um uh, today on the podcast, we are so excited. And so. Listen, this all kind of came about from Presley Poe and Friends. We were um, during Presley Poe and Friends. We were in the room with Charles and Sharon Riser, and we're also in the room with 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 the Godfather Sam Via himself. And um, and both of them were having a, like a long conversation about our guest today. And um, and I I guess we'll kind of get into like what she considers herself, but um, but basically they considered her a coach and not only a coach, but um, but one that absolutely positively changed their life, their trajectory, their careers, their all that. And like, if you know the risers and how successful they are, and we all know how successful Sam is, like if there was a person behind that, if there's a, if the, what, what's that, what's that saying behind every man is a great woman or something like if, if behind every success is a coach, man, like we, we had to have our guests on today. Yeah. And, and for those that don't know who the risers are, they own Paul Mitchell, the temple in, in Annapolis, uh, the very, very in Frederick. In, in Frederick, Maryland, where we get to host uh, Presley Poe and friends. Uh, yeah. And, and just when you listen to them talk about uh, our guests, it's just like, you know, you and I were like, yeah, we got to We got to figure this out. We got it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and our guest today is Lynn Christensen and, and Christian and, uh, and uh, she, um, she, 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 we had to bring her on. You she know? changes lives. She changes lives. Exactly. <laughs> I'm hoping to get some life change today. So, so Miss Lynn, like, welcome to your day off. I said, hey, thank you. It's off. my pleasure. How did I, 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 well, let's, let's just, let's just have a conversation. So where are you from, Lynn? I am from Utah, actually. Like uh, you were born and raised there? I was born and raised in Utah. Yes. So I live in Salt Lake City right now, but I was born and raised in a very small rural town um just over the mountains here from salt lake i tell you what we we fell in love with utah a few years ago we uh we met in vegas uh after uh barbacon uh we drove out to saint george uh, 
had lunch there. Uh, oh, what a cute little town. And then headed out to Zion. And uh, it was magical. I mean, the right. scenery, everything. We just fell in love with Utah. We're actually yeah. going to be in Salt Lake City in October. We're um, we're actually thinking about re yeah yeah. So we're thinking about redoing the um, the uh, the trip that we did, but but instead of stopping in Zion, we might drive all the way um up to Salt Lake City if it's not like a fourteen hour drive. <laughs> um, our friend Tyler Calvert, he does a a beauty and barber expo there in Salt Lake City. Actually, that's the name of it: Salt Lake City Beauty and Barber Expo. Um, yes. so we're going to come up, we're going to come up and do that in October. We've got a booth and we're going to be hanging out there. So, uh, we're, we're just big, huge fans of Utah. Are you still in Utah? Yeah. Yeah. I say I'm still in Utah. I live up by the Wasatch front in Salt Lake. Uh, so we get to have the mountains where I hike all the time. And then when we want to run down to the desert, it's five hours, four hours, three hours, depending upon which direction you go. So, so, uh, Salt Lake, not so, but Salt Lake city airport is like the most beautiful airport that I think right. I've ever landed in. It's incredible. Like I'm not, we fly a lot. So it's like, I'm not usually on the windows, like watching it, but flying in and out of there is just remarkable. Although we did have an emergency landing there. Y yeah. Did you? Oh no. <laughs> uh, Lynn, it was crazy. We, um, we, we were landing into, so we were heading to Bozeman. So we were like, you know, um, heading into, um, Salt Lake city. Oh, you, you were on that flight. I heard about that flight. No, stop it. <laughs> no stop seriously it. seriously stop it yeah and then we 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 well long story short is we circled the airport for a long time and i look over at tony and i go tony we're fine unless there's fire trucks all over the uh all over the runway and sure enough we do another pass and there's fire trucks lined up all the way down the runway we're like like why did you say that why did you tell <laughs> me that <laughs> you know i had one of those flying into salt lake myself from la i was out um working with a client in LA and, and it was nighttime, you know, it was, we finished work around six and I got on the last flight to Salt Lake and we could tell that we were circling and circling, circling. And I was kind of dozing and I didn't think much about it. And then the pilot came on and said, well, those of you who've noticed that we've been circling, we've been circling to see if our landing gear has extracted itself from the belly, of, <laughs> from the fuselage, if it's actually been in place. We're going to land now. If you see the fire engines, that's why they're there. Hang on. We're pretty sure the landing gear is intact, but our computer's telling us that it's not. And so here we go. Let's get ready. I was just scared to death. And we landed just fine, but it's never a good thing when you can see the, the rescue people around you and you're coming down on it. And it's like, holy shit, yeah. what's going to happen? That, 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 that was ours. That, that was exactly what happened. We we they couldn't find our landing gear and and they couldn't get it down. That's so crazy. We're so, coming from BWI though. Maybe something's in the air in, in Utah. <laughs> yeah, as soon as you come over those Rockies or something, <laughs> it freezes the uh, landing. <laughs> yeah, that's so the salt crazy. from Salt Lake evaporates. It maybe. <laughs> so crazy. Hey, all the white mountains around the airport is that salt or is that snow? That's snow. That's snow. So the salt is out west of the airport, just flat, as flat as can be. If you go out to Wendover, which is just on the border of Nevada, and I had done this with my kids. It's pretty spectacular. You go out in the early morning and watch uh, just before the sun comes up. You can literally see the curvature of the earth because it's so flat for so long that you get the angle, the angle of just this very slight curve. And it just is kind of breathtaking to go, oh my God, if I'm standing on a sphere and I can see that much of the curve, how big is this ball I'm standing on? But that's one of the flattest places in the world. That's where they had um, speed races because you can go for so long um, without- they did the land, is that where they did the, uh, the, the land record? Yes, exactly. The cars when they were like going like 700 miles an hour and they broke the, yes. the big sonic boom. Yeah. yeah that's it we had one of those in dc last weekend i, I mean i was yes a, you did i heard about that yeah I, I heard about it and then like our you know like of course your facebook and everything blows up about people uh -huh. going, what the heck mm -hmm. was that right yeah did they ever figure out what happened yeah there was a, a private jet um now i don't know all the details but there was a private jet flying into the space that it shouldn't but it was because they, they had lost the cabin pressure and people were dead on the jet so the jet was still flying Oh, but they had they had to scramble really fast and try to uh, make sure you know they could see that the the pilot was not responding, and so they just followed the jet and it crashed. I think it crashed in Virginia, didn't it? 
Yeah, I think so. I think it like Southern Virginia, but yeah, they those F eighteens deployed, and you know, once they deployed, it was. Yeah. They had to get out of there fast and see what's going on. So yeah, because I think it was the granddad, his daughter, his granddaughter, and the nanny. Mm. Remember that happened? Like like, that. Yeah, that happened to the golfer a, a few years ago. Yeah, Payne Stewart. Yeah, yeah, Payne Stewart. Yeah, I was wondering if we'd say Payne's his last name. I was like, what's this so? Story? Anybody who's listening to this podcast today, the moral of the story is be very careful with your air travel, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know we're talking yeah. about plane crash the whole time. So Lynn, I, get, kind of give us your title or give us like, like, you know, why, why the, why the risers and why the risers and Sam via like uh, reached out to you. Yeah. So I'm uh, the head coach here at soul salt, a company that I started uh, officially <clears throat> left my corporate job for 2000 at 2004, um, where I was director of innovation for Franklin Covey coaching. So I've been a coach since 1998. I am one of those certified coaches, like I have credentials from the International Coach Federation. I've gone to Australia to get neural uh, science certifications. So I have the equivalent of a master's degree in coaching um, with all these certifications in executive coaching and conversational intelligence, high impact coaching for performance. And I believe the reason that I got into the hair industry was way back when Paul Mitchell, the schools was forming um, Dennis James and when Claybaugh reached out to me and I, uh, invited Dennis James to Franklin Covey because I was teaching project management. I was teaching a day of project or two days of project management and then coaching out of a project management office to the staff at, Pre at Franklin Covey. Cause I was the only person with my PMP. So imagine a PMP behind your name doesn't stand for pimp. It stands for <laughs> <laughs> that stands for project management professional. So I had a, a PMP, I had a coaching certification. I was running the associate director out of a project management innovation center. And we were closing projects. Like we were starting to close projects. The COO had asked a couple of us to help with this. And so we built this office. We we're taking people through, teaching them project management. Uh, was talking to Dennis James at a party and he was like, we're starting all these schools. And I said, buddy, you need to have some project management. I will sponsor you. I'll get permission from Franklin Covey. You come sit in my class. And so he did. And then, uh, of course, that got the attention of Wynn. And so I worked a little bit with Wynn and his team. And Wynn let me come to some of the summits for project or from Paul Mitchell. And so that's how I got to meet the risers. I got to meet the uh, Sean and Sean Trujillo and Angie Katzenehas, uh, Andrea. Lang and Randy Lang. And so I know some of these peeps and, um, and Wynn's really, I think, responsible for this because one day I get a call from Vivian McKinder and she's like, Wynn Claybaugh says, I've got a coach with you. So we did a, I always do a, uh, what I call a discovery call. I don't know if I'm going to be the right coach, but I worked with enough people in the hair industry that I get the vibe. I've actually had two partners that were in the hair industry. Um, yeah, you know, that one was a color specialist, one was a really a, a great uh, curly, curly hair cutter. Anyway, my daughter is in the hair industry. She, oh, wow. uh, yeah, yeah, she's been a part owner in a salon. She's now taking a, a sabbatical leave with a baby. So I have this deep rooted love for the hair industry. You're about as much in the industry as you possibly could be right? being in the industry. Without being in the industry. Yeah, I can talk the shop. And uh, so- Win sent Vivian, and then um, I got to see meet the risers, and uh, and then um, and then of course Andrew Carruthers. Um, I know Andrew through both the Paul Mitchell group and uh, the Lunatic Fringe group, and he's he was talking with Sam, and so Sam called me up. So every once in a while I get to meet the royalty. Uh, I've even met uh, Vidal Sassoon. I haven't coached him, but I've met him and been on stage with him and had a picture taken. It was just highlight just a highlight so that's kind of how can i got I, can i drop a, can i drop a name real quick yeah right when we're done with lynn's podcast we are podcasting with beverly sassoon who was married to vidal um, no way yeah <laughs> way we've been it, it's been two years in the making um, we had his daughter eden on a couple years ago and then um and then uh we tried to get beverly on but it just took a little bit of time um for for it all to work out so literally as soon as we're done with you we're jumping on with beverly and we well, are excited you know, um, the one word I would say that described, well, two words, Vidal, class and elegance mm. as a person, not just the way he dressed, he was impeccable, just as an individual to be in his presence, you knew you were with a gentleman, you knew that you were with somebody who was savvy, creative, yeah, and big heart. 
I can't wait. I, he was like, oh, this is going to be a Vidal Sassoon thing. It's supposed to be a Lynn thing. I, I apologize. But, you know, we were about a half a generation past like, like Vidal. Like we, we, like, we we idolized like the people that were coming out of out of the Vidal like network or you know right. and stuff you know like Trevor Sorby was definitely our number one person um, and Vivian McKinder and Vivian McKinder yeah exactly um mm -hmm. so uh we 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 because of Vivian we actually got an opportunity to speak with uh with uh Trevor Sorby so that was yes she's friends with him yes yeah yeah, yes, we we did. We actually uh, we we had Trevor on, and Vivian listened in the entire conversation. And then um, at the end of the conversation, we um, we were like, "Hey, uh, Trevor, um, Vivian's been listening in." And then they had like a ten minute conversation. And what was really Aww. cool, and maybe like even from a coach perspective, it was you'll, you'll appreciate this even more, is that he during our podcast he apologized to her because he said that. He said, I've been waiting. I've been holding on to this for 10 years. I've been wanting to apologize to you because I know that you didn't want to come to America. And like, it was just this big, like love fest there. And it was, it was the only time where certainly me, like I didn't have anything to say for 10 minutes because it was just so much love being exchanged. It was really cool. It was really Sounds cool. Like a that. Beautiful moment. Yeah. Well, if Vivian hadn't come here, she wouldn't be with her lovely husband. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Even though she didn't want to come, she's glad she did come. And he regretted that, that, you know, he thought it would be the, be the best thing for her, but he didn't want her to go because he, you know, he loved her and wanted her to be there. And, but it was, it was an awesome kind of like this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Cool. <laughs> All right. Sorry. I interrupted. So uh, Andrew Carruthers, who we adore, he's been on the podcast too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, all these peeps, that's how I, I got here. And basically when I work with people, uh, most of it's coaching, meaning that we, we do that discovery call and we find out where are they taking their life or where do they want to take their life? And we write up objectives and we work on it. And the cool thing about my practice is I would say that we work 60% on their objectives and there's a whole new 40% that creeps in because you can imagine we don't know everything we don't know, but once we start working on certain basic uh, concepts, things open up for people and they get to see dimensions of themselves. So the core of what I do is assist people to excavate their best self. Literally, there's a best self in each person. You know pieces of it. There's so much of it that's hidden. And some of that's because by the age of seven or eight, you've been socialized, you've been trained, you've been educated, you've been disciplined, you've been uh, praised, and you now have your belief system completely wired by that age. And imagine going through the rest of your life, not ever questioning your beliefs or evolving those or progressively changing them out. That's why when Keegan is written, he's a, a great social scientist, why he's developed this developmental theory about adults. He says that about 65% of us are still not fully evolved to where we could be. And that's really my quest is to assist people that want to to get in and evolve themselves to the next level and to recognize that in the process, it's going to be something that you maybe want to pay attention to every 18 months or so, because nothing stays the same. So once you figure out these, what we call the salt of your soul, uh, which was, uh, by the way, we can talk about that later about how my company got named because I did not name it, <laughs> but my company's name soul salt. We find the salt of your soul. You start guiding your life. You map that out. You follow that. And you're being true to yourself. Who tells you how to be true to yourself? They tell you to be true to yourself. But we actually find the formula for you to know how you are true to yourself. So that's really the basis of what I do. Is it is it one-on-one -on -one coaching? Because I mean, earlier you talked about you had Wynn come uh, hang out in a in a group session or... Uh... Yeah, so I worked with his group. So yes, I, my my job is usually what I get to do for a living. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I do group coaching. I have boot camps. I also have master classes and I go and speak. So it could be one of many ways of delivery and da, 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 because you guys asked, recently I took the basics of what I do with my clients, a year's worth of life coaching and put it in Soul Salt, your field guide, personal field guide for confidence, purpose, and fulfillment. So I know that I won't reach everybody that I want to reach. And so I put all my secrets in Soul Salt, the book, and you can read that and have a year's worth of life coaching. So it's also available on Amazon. It's on Amazon, most bookstores, Barnes and Noble. Uh, yeah, go online. You can find it. 
I'll, I'll, I'll have one ordered. I'll have one delivered by tomorrow. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Amazon. Yeah. That's yeah. incredible, man. <clears throat> and it, what, what, how did you find this? That this is what you wanted to do. Right. Um, yeah. Because to help people like that, it, it, it's incredible. Well, so um, through life. So I, everything that I put in this book is something that I learned, you know, having been raised one way and waking up one day in a marriage, you know, and I'm as queer as you can get. In fact, um, so here's something for you guys. I actually found out a year ago, uh, I'm non-binary. So my pronouns are they, them. Freak out. Like when you're 63 years old, I'm now 64. You find out, oh, wait, I'm not a lesbian. I'm non-binary. <laughs> it was like trip out. That was okay. That's that's who I am. So I started here in Utah. You can imagine uh, the society that I grew up in, very dominated with a religion and just had to hide from who I was and eventually found myself in a marriage and it was going south and I left it. And the thing that I had to rely on were these little tidbits of listening to an inner truth. So from about age 30, I started really paying attention to who am I, what are these elements I need to pay attention to, and how do they guide me? And they guided me out of that marriage, and then I was dating another man, and then this other person, and then a woman came into my life, and the moment we kissed, I was like, damn, that's why they put chemistry in movies. <laughs> that was the real thing. I was like, I want more of that. And so uh, we were together about five years, and then I decided, yeah, this is for real. I came out of the closet. I asked to be excommunicated from the, the religion here. That was a whole process. But every, every step along the way, that whole process before I came out, I could feel this thin gold line of truth running from the top of my head down to my feet. And I was like, what is that? And everything was against me. Okay. I was maybe going to lose my kids. My, my parents, I came out to them thinking maybe my parents and my family would support me. They say they love me. They threw me out of the house. So it was like, okay, I can lose my kids. I can lose my family. I can lose all of my friends. I did. I lost all of my so social structure, but I didn't know that what was going to happen before I came out. And I could feel this truth saying, you've got to say it. So I pried the words out of my mouth. I'm gay. And then all hell broke loose. And I went into a deep depression. I I absolutely, um, I walked away from the five-year relationship because she couldn't leave the church. I couldn't stay in it. I mean, it was cathartic. I it was the only time in my life where I contemplated maybe ending it because I couldn't see a way through it. I understand when people are in that dark place of it will never get better. I've lost everything. Nothing's, you know, I went into a deep depression. My health was suffering. And when I came out, and finally got a grasp of how good life could be, I had this great trajectory. And it was like, okay, this is the real deal. When you are really true to yourself, it turns out for the better. You need a small support system. I had three people who supported me. Everybody else was gone and almost in an instant. My kids never left me. I had three people outside of my three children. That was my little core and I built a life. Today, I earn more in a quarter than I ever did in corporate America in a year. I have the quality of life I want. I have the home I want. I have the relationships I want. It all came from finding these little increments. And so what I did is I put those, the way that I found myself to self and the way that I guide my life, I put in the book. And I said, you find these eight things and you can guide a life on your terms. And I had to go through hell, fire, and damnation to find it. And I found it. And it really is the salt of your soul. And so it's a genuine, if you know, if these words are going around to anybody, we all have to come out to ourselves. I'm really serious. It's not a queer thing. It's everybody. There are pieces of us that we haven't owned. We haven't realized. We hadn't even thought that we could choose. Like I, I talk about Einstein. One day he was musing. He was like, I think people stop choosing. They get in a rat race. He, he could see them going numb. He could see them just giving up he could see them placating themselves and going along with other people's expectations he says i think people stop choosing and i put his quote in the book because i feel like we have we don't know that we have more choices we have a purpose we have unique personal needs 
we have a core value system, we have superpowers, we have weaknesses we need to pay attention to, we have pseudo strengths that can can uh, juke us out and 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 actually take us to burnout. We have uh, possibilities inside of us, all of these things. And then we have these places that get inspired uh, by other people. You put those together in a package. And what I did is I made it so that when you find those things out, you put them on a map, you get a map with a book. You can also buy a bigger map if you want it. But then you have these map, this map with all of these pieces that are your personal gold, you know, the best pieces of you. And you can keep those in front of you, make your decisions, live your life, let them guide you, check in with yourself once a week and see how you're doing, changes the trajectory of your life, which is exactly interesting because isn't that what you said that Sam and Sharon and Charles were saying? It's just, I didn't make this shit up. I just found it as I was wandering through the darkness. And then I decided, let me share it with other people. Lynn, I, like we keep qualifying you as a coach, but is it is it more like therapy than it is a coach? Like what's your coaching style? And 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 because to me it sounds way it sounds more like therapy than um than than what what we traditionally know or refer yeah. to as coaching. Well, I can't work with people who are not healed. So if you need healing, and you can't work with anyone, Lynn. No one, none well, of us are healed. <laughs> okay, who have not healed some part of their life right? We're all a mess. We always have something to work on. You know, we do. I think that's the the human um, challenge. But uh, I really do feel a gap between people who you, you can do therapy while you're working with me, people who have probably competed, pleaded a, an area where they feel like they've healed something. And now they want to know, how do I take steps? How do I put on, you know, the backpack and the hiking boots now and go to that summit? I think that's one thing. Um, the, other, the the secret that a lot of people, I don't, I don't publicize this, but I'll let this out of the bag, I'm very intuitive. And so my style is you not only get me, you get all the connections that I have. And I may wake up in the morning and you're on my mind and I'm calling you finding out what's going on because I can feel something with you. So there's some clairvoyance, some clairaudience, some clairsentience. I get, I get vibes. And sometimes I'm coaching somebody and the things they need to hear just go right through the top of my head and out of my mouth. And I don't know what I said, but they're sitting there going, that's just what I needed. So my style is very personal to the individuals that I choose to coach. I don't coach everybody. You've got to qualify to, you know, you've got to come through one of my discovery sessions. They have to be a match. I have another set of my staff that I might pass you to if I think they're a better fit, but it's very intuitive. I study a lot from the therapy world because there may be some things that I can learn from them, mm -hmm. like self-regulation. Uh, but I really am between that gap of therapy and just hardcore executive coaching because I coach the entire person. I don't just coach the professional side. We get into the personal side because I don't know anybody that really can go in to work and shut themselves off and be happy for the rest of their lives. I mean, that's one reason why I love the hair industry. People in your industry, they show up in themselves, hopefully, behind the chair, wherever they are. They are, are themselves and they don't have to compartmentalize who they are at home when they walk through the door. Yeah. And I, I get exactly what you were saying. Uh, you know, when, when, when you're saying you got to be healed uh, in order, because if you can't get past what, what has broken you, you're not ready to take these next steps that you're willing or ready right. to help them with. And uh, so that, that totally makes sense to me. Yeah, sometimes I'll work in tandem with their therapist. You know, they'll be working with a therapist. I have a gentleman right now on the East Coast who's working with a therapist because the stories he was given as a little boy in his head really have him stuck. But between the two of us, especially since we talk, he's making these huge strides because he has a team behind him. You know, he has a team. Another area of expertise that I should mention is, if you can imagine, I have reinvented my working identity several times in my personal identity you know i was cis a cis female then a lesbian now non-binary however if you look at my professional life i was going to go to law school as a, a high school student and i changed that had a cathartic moment uh, with a little addiction i was playing with in high school where i just didn't have the energy one day and i thought shit am i going to wake up every morning and go argue the rest of my life and i was sitting literally in a gutter and I looked across the street and I was like, that's my elementary school. I remember this teacher and this teacher and how they made me feel. 
I am not going to go to law school. I'm going to go teach kids mm-hmm. how to be their best self. So I had uh, 15 years as a as an educator, typically sixth graders. And uh, then I became an educational consultant. And then I became a writer and developer uh, in the innovation group of Franklin Covey. Then I worked up into this project management job. And then the coaching group uh, knew that I had my MCC, my master certification in coaching. And they came over and said, hey, would you be our director of innovation for Franklin Covey Coaching? So the last job I left, I was in that group. So then I started Soul Salt and I was just coaching. Now I'm a TED Talk speaker. I'm a best-selling uh, author on Amazon with this book. And so you can see how many iterations I've had. So I've studied this thing about career reinvention because the studies show us we're probably going to have for a lot of people, now not necessarily in the hair industry because a lot of people get in and stay, uh, but there are still a, a number that never, you know, they graduate from hair school and never never stick. So the, the statistics are every uh, four years, you may change work what you do for a living. And um, you may have up to 10 different things that you can look back and say that I did that. And that was my career path. So I do a lot with career reinvention because people get stuck doing things that they're not happy with. You know, I I think that, I mean, you brought up that you didn't think it was going to be common in the hair space. And and I I disagree with you a little bit because there's so much that's involved in the hair space. You know, Like never, like Tony and I were like 30 year hairdressers, you know, before we started a podcast, you know? So I I think that, I think that the, I think that the hair industry allows you to, to, to have that, you know, proverbial side hustle or, or that, or that side thing, whether it's coaching, there's so many people that certainly after COVID that got into the coaching space and there's um, so many people that have gotten into education, i.e. Sam Bia, or, you know, even, even the schools like, like Charles did as a hairstylist. Um, ownership um you know yeah. become a salon well, so so i look at this yeah no i see what you're saying let me um qualify that because i don't think we're disagreeing no we're not disagreeing at all actually i think there's a whole career path you can have in the hair industry if you open your eyes to what's possible right like you can stay attached and do a podcast or do these other things and still be in the family and that's one thing that i see um for instance, I, I got a phone call yesterday from someone that was Sunday and I'll, I'm on retainer for my clients. So if I have weekend time free and they need it, I give it to them. I, I safeguard my personal time so I don't get burned out. I love what I do. She was coming home from camping. She's leaving the funeral business Ooh. and going into nonprofit. That kind of jump is what I'm saying happens more on the outside of the hair industry because the hair industry has this love for creativity and flair and flow and fashion and people. And so once you get in it, sometimes you want to stay in it, but you can reinvent some other sort of strand of it and stay connected. Whereas out in the corporate world, I see people wanting to walk away from say wealth management or law or engineering and do something else. And they want to do something completely different. And so I don't see that as much, although it does happen, I don't see it as much in the hair industry And I think it's because people self-select there with more of their heart intact than their head saying, you got to do this. (laughs) That makes sense. Yeah, it totally does. I I am one that lives by mantras. And and my favorite thing in the world is to steal other people's mantras. And the one that's currently in my head, are you familiar with Megan Phelps Roper? No, but maybe I need to be. Tell me what's the mantra. (laughs) Thank you. Well, I, I will get there. Let me set it up first. <laughs> All right. Because because it, it needs to be set up. So Megan Phelps Roper, her grandfather was the patriarch of the Westbury Baptist Church. And if we kind of remember the Westbury Baptist Church from the 90s, it wasn't the like it wasn't the greatest like a uh, representation of of of, of that of, of them anyways. Right. So, um, so, uh, in the nineties, the Westbury Baptist church, they used to protest a lot of soldier, a, a lot of soldiers that died in action and a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, school shooting kids, they would protest their funerals, which, you know, frankly is kind of gross. Um, but she, her grandfather was the patriarch of that. And at 26 years old, she left the church and she, um, and now she's on this, uh, crusade for, for free speech and stuff. However, the reason that she, she met a rabbi on Twitter which is strange to think about, you know, like that's what you can see <laughs> from Twitter. But she met a rabbi on Twitter, and then they were having, um, they were having uh, conversations about scripture, not really a debate, but conversations, and and it forced her to like look at scripture in a different way. And so then she, that's why she left the Westbury Baptist Church. However, her mantra, which I've stolen, 
now that we've set up mm-hmm. is every day she asks herself, what if I'm wrong? You know, mm-hmm. what if, what if the thoughts that I'm having, what if, what if, what if, however I'm living is wrong? What if, what if I'm wrong? You know, and, 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 and I've picked that up particularly with, you know, where we are politically, where we are, you know, whenever you have an opinion or something in the back of my head, it's always like, but what if I'm wrong? You yeah. know, and it's been like this real humbling kind of like mantra that I use um, just to kind of like level myself and to go like, you know, you don't, what if I'm wrong? I think that's a beautiful one to have. I can see it um, just last week playing out. Uh, one case is, you know, somebody who is maybe more right wing starting to question, what if I'm wrong? And they're probably not going to go left wing, but they'll probably move more into the center as a centrist because they're asking questions. I know of somebody um, who is questioning monogamy and looking at polyamory. You know, there's so many places where I think that's a great mantra because things are changing. As a human race, we're evolving and we're becoming more expansive. And the things that we were taught 10 years ago or even that we thought were our truth, really do need to evolve with us. I mean, that's that's what another reason why I brought I wrote the book is you need to keep questioning yourself. Uh, you really do. The only thing that I've really stuck to for a long time as a mantra for me is my definition of how I will measure success in life. And that is, I'm going to ask myself at the end of my life, um, how open is my mind still? And how soft is my heart? Because if those things remain soft and open, I'll probably be in a good place because I'll probably be able to accept where we as a human race might be taking ourselves for the better. You know, you know, what's interesting is that on that note is that, and I'm sure when we were all kids, it was kind of this, like the elders or the, or the, the yeah. people older in your life, they, they seem to be really hard and be like, you know, stuck on ideology or so, or, or you know, kind of like promoting that. But as I've gotten older, I've definitely felt that way. Like, right. As testosterone in my body has kind of lowered and stuff, like I kind of feel like I certainly live my life way more heart forward than I ever did. Than I That's ever did. awesome. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, you, you see, a lot of times, a lot, a lot of people who get older, they do, they get angry. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, I have a hypothesis about that. Oh, let's hear it. Yeah. So if we're not evolving, if we're not progressing, we just become more of that person we're stuck in. And how would you not be angry? Um, gosh, they've done so many studies. I can think of two where they've talked to people in their in their dying days and found out that more people have regrets than not. And the number one regret is that they wish were more true to other people's expectations than their own. I would be pissed off if yeah. that's my. And the other thing that they found is that most people are full of regret about the things they didn't do more than the bad things that they did. So that would make you angry. So, yeah, I don't I think a lot of us were raised in ways where you do this and then here's your here's who you are. Here's your script. And if you live that, I think you'd be feel like you were fucked at the end of your life. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. My dad died of Alzheimer's and not to make a wool party, but my dad died of Alzheimer's. And what was interesting is watching him decline is that is that what was on the surface was was that insecure man, right? Like right. like all the all the depth and all were gone with him, and he was just left with that insecure man. And that's and that's kind of again as he got worse, which was like which which the only thing that you could see, right? There was no longer the wow. depth, it was just like this insecure person that was sitting there, and that that to me made me sad, and not sad for me, you know, but sad for him and sad for, sad the, for him. Like like that was like. And listen, I don't know how this disease works necessarily, but it just kind of sucked to see what I consider the worst part of him. Yeah, that was, was leading. That, that was leading. Thank you. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, it was, I, I mother, saw that in my father too. Yeah, it was yeah, my, sad to watch. Oh, yeah. absolutely. My mother-in-law lived with us and she was headed that way. She was like an angry elf. And uh, and uh, she lived with us. And then over the years, um, her and I would sit out, sit up at night and have conversation and because every time we had something with the family or something, she always had to work. She just worked, work, work, work. And I said, at the end of the, at the end of your life, are you going to be wanting to spend more time at work? Are you going to, mm-hmm. you know, cause she's angry cause she's missing everything. 
Right. And she went part time and she started to hang, you know, hang out with us more and more and more. And of course, my wife's like, what are you doing? You know, uh, why is my mom <laughs> all the time? But, uh, what if I'm wrong? But at, but at the what end, if of I'm the wrong? Way, uh, you can see she started to soften up, you know, oh. uh, and and at the, and when she was on her deathbed, I was, you know, was the last one to, to go in and talk to her and and uh she wanted me to to be with there with her and it was just you can see change even at 82 83 years old i mean people can still change and yeah and, they can yeah it was just beautiful just seeing you know because somebody else is just pouring into them they they're just stuck something and you need help right. you yeah know? you do i think you gave her a wake-up call through your gentle questioning you know, when we ask questions, we can open up the neurochemistry to hear something versus when we're told. And it sounds like you did that and probably helped her change her life. So I hope you take that in because obviously she wanted you to be there at the end. Yeah. Yeah. And she actually, she tell everybody, you know, <laughs> she would tell my daughter, <laughs> you're lucky. You know, she was like, if, if my, if my wife was giving uh, me a hard time, she, uh, my mother-in-law would just jump right in front of me and, 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 and <laughs> me. it's so funny yeah she was she was my friend oh you had the mother-in-law bulldog right when you needed it yep yeah exactly yeah i wonder uh, if i wonder if and i'm going to take this conversation way off but uh but let's go uh, i can't wait where are you going the room, so let's do like i wonder if like you know as we sit here in like 2023 if we're a victim of 1900 you know because in 1900 is when we started to be more of a a a a like a factory, you know, we, we right. were put in school to be better workers. We were put in school to, 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 to work for the machine a little bit better. So I wonder if a lot of the anxiety and, and all that stuff um, that we deal with today is, is a carryover from instead of living who our true self is now we're, 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 we're programmed to, um, to, you know, be factory workers or to, to work for the machine. Yeah. It's a really great hypothesis. There's probably something to it. You know, because there are a lot of things we're living out that are archaic. Like you mentioned, like the nine month school year, um, for those who are not in year round, that was because of the agrarian culture. So we need the kids home. Everybody needs to farm. We need all hands on deck. Oh, what do we do with them now? They're driving us crazy. <laughs> so let's send them off to school in the fall, keep them all winter, you know, contained, and then we can use them again in the summer. So yeah, there are a lot of things that we're still doing because of tradition. And yeah, I, and I want to take my hat off to the hair industry because I think you guys are disruptors. I think you guys are finding new ways to do work. I mean, you've created this whole culture around grooming and style and just cutting off the the protein that keeps growing on the top of our heads you know so it's like <laughs> hey that's inventive uh let's do that instead of have mom do it in, you know around the kitchen table and i feel like we have more disruption going on now than we ever have i look at the generations coming up and the shit that they won't take and the way that they're thinking so i do see a change in the future and I think some of these traditional things are starting to lag. I think that's why we're so polarized, as I think it's really a, a battle between innovation and the future and tradition and the past. Yeah, I think I I I think I, you're absolutely right. But you know, if I start to you know start to think about it even more, like, you know, also like our grandparents certainly and, and, and our parents, I would guess too, is that you know, they had blue chip jobs, right? They had like one company, their entire career right. rely on that. Well, as, 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 um, uh, corporations started like re removing or, or you no longer those blue chip jobs or, or firing people when the bottom line made sense, you know, it, 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 it questions what loyalty is. And at some point that question has to come back to you and are you loyal to yourself? And, and I think that that's kind of like part of the, uh, the transition in, in thinking as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is, um, that's my work is assisting people to find out how to be loyal to themselves. And now that you're saying it, I didn't realize this, but I think one of the reasons that I have a non-traditional career track is I had a grandfather who worked in mines as a young boy, then lumber. At one time, he ran a fox ranch where he was raising foxes for, um, gosh, and this is probably in the, the, the 30s and 40s where he was raising the foxes for the fur. And then he had a dairy farm and then he invested in stocks and figured out how to make money there. 
Uh, I think about my father, who was a miner as well, and then a truck driver and a carpenter. And I think, oh, I looked at their legacy and I didn't have anybody that was in corporations. And so maybe in a way, uh, this would be a time for us to look at our past and go, who influenced us? I think it's good for us to look at whose shoulders are we standing on, where they did give us something good from the past, but we can make the future better because we're not buying into it always has to look like the past. Does that make sense? Oh, completely. Yeah, right. Yeah. Otherwise, you look like Rickovic with the 1972. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, not only did it make sense, Lynn, it was like eye opening. Like it was like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, 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 that makes more than sense. You know, it, it kind of it feels. Well, I know. Look, I'm going to, this is a little off track here. I, Ace, if you're listening, brother, I'm just joking, buddy. He was our tour guide and on the inside uh, on the, on the glacier hike, right? So we're we're, we're doing this glacier hike, and he and so we start talking about the podcast, and he so he's he he uh listen he he started listening to the podcast. So if you're listening, I'm just joking about Rick Vick, okay? The buildings are. <laughs> he's coming to get you, man. He's <laughs> hey, Lynn, is your book available on audio? Please say yes. So uh, it will be. We're just making the last edits to it. So uh, watch for July, maybe the end of June. It will be. Yeah, because that's to me, that was the thing that we needed to do next. So I've been in the studio. And uh, if you see my little dog eared version, those are we don't have that many. We only have like four edits and it will be out. Oh, that's awesome. Please let me know when it's on audio. I will. I, I, I will. Do all I will. my consumption in the car. So um, so that would yeah. be great great i that would be awesome i would i would absolutely um love that um so i yeah i'm kind of lost like where to go next if we went all over the place well i'm going to ask you guys a question can i yeah completely of course because i think this is important for people to do and it is a chapter uh i love to do this with people and i've shared with you guys how i'm going to measure success in my life but let's just i want to find out from you guys how are you guys measuring success how do you know if you've been successful um, I, I'm going to give the worst answer ever in that, like, I, I, I learned to work, honestly, I mean, just through the podcast in the last few years, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm understanding, um, what kind of work is, you know, I kind of feel like you know, as a hairdresser, I just kind of did it, but I, I wasn't like actively doing it. I don't know how to explain it, but I, I feel like I'm really committed, um, to, I've committed to myself through the podcast and I think hairdressing was just a way, listen, I'm a knucklehead kid, you know, with barely mm -hmm. a high school education. Um, I, I think that a lot of years in the hair industry, which I love, so don't take it as anything other than love, but I think that I was doing it because I didn't know what else to do. Um, listen, right. The hair industry allows like normal idiots like myself, a, a career and not only a career, but you know, you can, you, you can, the money's unlimited is, is, is unlimited. The, um, the, uh, the, 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 the balance is unlimited. Um, so, you know, I, 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 right now, as I speak today, like I, I, I'm really proud of what we've done with the podcast. I'm, I'm really proud that we're reaching hairstylists that work behind the chair. I'm really proud that we're reaching the people that were like me that might be in the industry because there's no other options, but we can kind of mm -hmm. give options or give, um, you know, motivation, you know, I, yeah. don't, I think yeah. what I did was wrong. I just think it wasn't until I was 50 that I realized you know, where I stand in the industry as a whole, as opposed to just standing behind my chair. Um, so how do I measure success? I don't know if I'm there yet. I don't know if I don't, if I, if I know how, cause right now I'm just, I'm in the grind of, of trying to reach as many people as we possibly can with our, in our beautiful industry. Well, in, a, in and of itself, you know, it doesn't have to be life encompassing right. Mm -hmm. There is a metric reach as many people as possible. There you go. You're measuring right now the podcast. Yeah. For me, I'm completely different. Um, like I grew up at kind of like angry, right? And then yeah. I met my wife and she softened me up, but not until I had my daughter where I truly learned how to love unconditionally. I tell my wife all the time, you know, Skyla taught me how to love you, you know, she's my baby. So, but, um, I'm truly content like people ask me, how are you? And I say blessed. Mm. Uh, I got two grandbabies, another one on the on way. Uh, my, I've been married 32 years. I got a, wow. uh, two beautiful kids and uh, a great friendship, uh, successful at hairdressing. Uh, we have a great podcast. 
I'm, I'm so blessed that if I look at how I grew up and then what I'm doing right now, um, I, you know, it could end today and I'm, I'm content. Well, well, we got a lot of stuff to do. It can't end today. No, but you no, know. but I but I'm hearing a lot of the success is coming from connection with people, love, personal growth into that compassionate, and and you feel like you've succeeded, and that must feel very comforting and satisfying. It truly is, because if I, th you know, we did some breath work the other uh, last last summer, and uh, or last fall, and you know, you got to go into your inner self, your your inner child. And I truly made peace with that young Tony because he was so angry at everybody at the world. He, you know, he, I'm not saying he was a victim, but he was, he, yeah, he was a, a victim of his circumstances and, and, and that's what created this anger. And, but all that's totally healed. It's totally gone. And, uh, you know, and I'm so at peace. That's amazing. I wish more people could say that. Listen, I don't, listen, breath work is woo woo as it, as it is, is incredible. Oh, Hey, it's, it's neurobiology. So I believe it. I believe it. And, um, I want to, I want to pose this question to your audience, because I think this is one of the elements of people's soul salt is being familiar with how to define success, success for the day, success for the weekend, success for this vacation, success for your education success for the year and eventually you get to maybe a mantra that holds you close and dear and safe for your life that would be the thing i would challenge your listeners from today our conversation is take some time and and grow up into it and experiment with small chunks of how do i define success and then eventually know that you have that right you're sovereign you should be the person or could be the person who is literally defining how you will measure success at the end of your life. That, that to me sounds like freedom, you know, like freedom to yeah. express freedom to be, you know, I, yeah. I, think, I mean, beautiful. you know, kind of, you kind of like going back on what Tony was saying, not going back on, but you know, picking up where he did is that I, I, I do feel success in that I've, I've chosen to live the life that I, that I have. Right. You have. Yeah. You know, you I'm, can see I'm, it. Unlike that, unlike the, the, the warehouse story or the factory story that I was telling before, like to where, you know, so many, so many of the people that we do stand on, you know, kind of grew up in that life. Like we have, or I have, you know, um, chosen, chosen the life that I have, you know, with, through hairdressing, through the podcast, through, through whatever, you know, I'm in control of, of all that, not in a, not in a control kind of way, but just really, I find it that successful that I've been able to make these, been able to make, you know, these decisions and, you know, to Tony's point too, like, I don't do that without the support of my family, my wife and all that too, you know, like, um, she's been amazing with yeah. uh, just kind of letting me, you know, find out who I am. And, and, you know, once again, uh, I'll thank her forever and ever and ever, because I'm gonna start crying. Hold on. Damn you, Lynn. Um, you know, just that she, she takes up a lot of the stuff. She takes up a lot of the family stuff. She takes up a lot of that. And that allows me to be, you know, yeah. and, and, and I don't, I don't know. I, I, she, she was the perfect woman for me to be in a relationship with because, you know, she's given me that freedom for me to find out who I am, even if it's in spite of her own self and how she finds herself. And and I don't know how to repay that because she's not one that, that, that needs repayment necessarily. But, um, but I think that her love language is making sure that I'm okay. And, you know, if you're listening, I'm okay. Yeah, you know, that kind of support is what all of us need in our own love language, to, to to borrow that. When we have that, we're unshakable. We get, you know, we get that inner ability to say, who am I? What's my truth? And then we have a support system around us. Okay, now you're formidable, right? Yeah, oh, for sure. For sure. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking we should start every morning off with the podcast with Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Let's do it. Let's we'll do call it. it a podcast. You know, we'll call it a podcast. One hour podcast every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like a meditation, man. Ah, uh, you're it's, you're incredible. Yeah. Well, thank you. I have so enjoyed being with you guys, and I want to I want to read this quote because I think you guys have hit on this in different ways, and this might be good for your audience. So this is what Albert Einstein actually said. He said, "How many people are trapped in their everyday habits, part numb, part frightened, part indifferent?" to have a better life, 
we must keep choosing how we're living. And if nothing more, I think the things that we've talked about and the things that you guys discuss with other people on your podcast, you're helping people ask themselves that question almost subconsciously. So I take my hat off to you guys. If I had one, you guys have the best hats. I got to get one of those. Um, <laughs> you can send you one. <laughs> send awesome. you one. Yeah. Yeah. So that's for you guys in the audience. It's been such a joy to listen to you. And um, if you're in, if you are in Salt Lake in October, uh, you know, maybe we'll go to one of the pubs and have another conversation. Uh, oh, we're going to hold you to that. Yeah. All right. We're definitely going to hold you to that. And, uh, and, and, you know, if you're in the area too, why don't you just stop by, stop by and come and uh, hang out with all of our lovely uh, uh, hairdressers. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I should. And I will be out in Maryland. So where are you guys based? We're right in Maryland. Yeah. 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 We're, we're, okay. in yeah, we're Frederick, Maryland. You're in Frederick. Okay. So I think I'm headed out there September-ish. So um, for sure, we'll have to touch base one way or the other. If you're here, let's go have dinner. We okay. will. Maybe we can have dinner with Sharon and Charles and like we can all kind of oh, like, man. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be great. That'd be so great. Miss Lynn Christian. Oh, d d how can people find you? Give us the, give us the deets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can find me at soulsalt.com. I'm also posting a lot on Soul Salt Inc. on Instagram. I'm not so much a Facebook person. Um, I'll double post, but I'm not responding on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, and you can also find me by my name. Lynn is L-Y-N Christian. Uh, I'm on Instagram there as well. But go to soulsalt.com. You can find blogs. I have um, tons of stuff there that's free. And I'm just I'm just hanging out at Soul Salt. <laughs> That's awesome. Miss Lynn Christian, thank you for hanging out with us and thank you for joining us on your day off. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hair Street on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.